The, the arc of digital technology has been to empower individuals, to empower end users, fans, customers, consumers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, traditionally in copyright law, the targets, the people you've put pressure on, uh, if you're a copyright owner, have been intermediaries. Uh, people who print books, people who duplicate video cassettes, people who make records. Uh, it used to take a lot of uh, expensive equipment to do that. So as a copyright owner, if you could crack down on the people who have the record pressing facilities, you more or less have taken care of your problem. Well, of course, digital technology is rapidly changing that. We live in a world now where each of us has the ability to make records, to press records, to share records, to transmit records, uh, music to everyone uh, in the world. Uh, and so what you're seeing is increasingly an effort by copyright owners to control the technology that makes that possible. So, for example, to try to sue people who make software, uh, to sue people who are making the hardware, uh, and ultimately, really, the focus turns on the individual themselves. So mp3.com was a company that, that was uh, trying to let music fans enjoy their own music wherever they happened to be, wherever they were connected to the Internet. Uh, and they were sued for trying that because they didn't get permission from the major music labels first. Uh, and they ultimately lost that lawsuit. And so that approach, having a central website that stores your music on your behalf, was pretty much put out of business. Then next came peer-to-peer. Peer-to-peer didn't res uh, rely on a central website. Instead, you had a situation where each of us stored our music on our own computers and transmitted that music to each other directly. There was no longer a website they could target. Instead, they targeted the software that was capable of doing that and the companies that made that software. So you saw lawsuits against Napster, Aimster, Audio Galaxy, Grokster, iMesh, you know, Kazaa. All of these companies were sued. And in the end, essentially, the entertainment industry succeeded in driving that technology out of the mainstream commercial field. They didn't succeed in shutting down the technology. There's more file sharing going on with this software today than ever before. But they did succeed in driving the companies out of it. There are now very few people who can be in the business making money selling that software. Turns out there are many people who make the software as a hobby without thought of business, and they continue to make the software available, and that's what's currently uh, you know, being used more and more. But in the end, failing in their effort to stop the, this ability to share music among like-minded fans, the industries turned to suing individuals. And so in the United States, beginning in 2003, uh, the recording industry started suing hundreds of individuals, ultimately thousands, now tens of thousands of individuals for downloading music without permission, or actually, to be more specific, for uploading music, for sharing the music with others. Um, the movie industry joined in and has now also sued thousands of people in the United States. They won't tell us exactly how many, uh, but they've confirmed there are thousands and that they continue to sue hundreds of people at a time on a regular basis. Uh, most recently, the recording industry has focused particularly on college students uh, and have, has been bringing lawsuits against hundreds of college students every month. Um, so here we see a shift. Having been unable to uh, change reality by suing technology companies, although they have, I will hasten to add, tried to mold the law so that they could use that law against future innovators, they've also extended their, uh, their legal campaign now against individuals. Uh, and they're under no illusion that they'll be able to sue every single person. Instead, what they've sought to do is sue a few people, punish them severely enough, that they can essentially intimidate a large number of other people. Uh, it's really as though they decided to intimidate the village, they would just chop off the heads of a few villagers, mount those heads on pikes as a warning to everyone else. Well, not only, I think, is that an immoral way of trying to control uh, the public, but it's also terribly unfair to the few villagers who've had their heads taken off and to, to use as an example against others. So you see grandparents and college students and parents uh, being targeted for multi-thousand dollar uh, settlements uh, at a time when we all know that their neighbors, their colleagues, their classmates are engaged in the same activity and have gotten away scot-free. So, you know, it's both in, it, you know, it both doesn't work, it's, you know, uh, ineffective, it's also very grimly unfair. 
The No Electronic Theft Act was one of several laws that have been passed to extend criminal liability for copyright infringement. Traditionally, copyright infringement has just been a civil matter. If a copyright owner catches you doing something wrong, they can sue you and force you to pay them money. Um, criminal infringement liability, the ability to prosecute you and throw you in jail, has been reserved for circumstances of commercial piracy. It's circumstances where you know someone has made 500 copies, is selling them on the street as a competition for the, for the real thing. Well, in recent years, copyright owners have not been satisfied with that. They have wanted to reach out and be, uh, have criminal uh, recourse against people who are engaged in non-commercial activities. And the no, uh, the no Electronic Theft Act was the beginning of that. Uh, it was enacted in response to a guy who was, had a, uh, a site, that, a bulletin board at the time, that allowed people to upload software and download software, and he wasn't getting paid. He wasn't in it for the money. He frankly was, uh, it was a hobby for him. Uh, and ultimately, they, uh, the copyright owners persuaded Congress to pass a law that would basically put him in a position, and people like him, in a position where they could actually go to jail. Uh, and so they created a model that said, well, if you share or make available or copy more than a certain number of works worth a certain amount of money over a certain period of time, we can throw you in jail for that. And then, of course, since then, there have been additional amendments that have been passed in an effort to try to extend that to reach peer-to-peer -peer file sharers. People who, they're not in it for the money. Nobody on peer-to-peer -peer is getting paid for sharing their, the, the, the music, the movies. Uh, and so recently, Congress amended the law again to say if you share a film that is not yet on DVD, that is just in theaters but not yet on DVD, Doing that for no commercial purpose whatsoever is a criminal offense, and you can potentially be uh, uh, criminally prosecuted and potentially jailed for doing that. Uh, so we're seeing this, again, ongoing one-way ratchet that says we need more and more remedies to try to punish people uh, for making copies, even if they're doing it without any intention of commercial gain. The efforts to stem uh, music fans, movie fans, making copies of the things they love, uh, those efforts really haven't been very successful. Um, and we see an increasing number of laws that are being pressed that will try to increase the penalties uh, against uh, these people in what I think is ultimately a futile attempt to essentially hold back the tide. Uh, and we're seeing, interestingly, even a resistance on the part of law enforcement to get dragged into this. So despite the fact that laws like the No Electronic Theft Act have been passed, despite the fact that many more laws are being pushed for by the entertainment industries in Washington right now, um, we're not seeing an eagerness on the part of law enforcement to start throwing teenagers in jail. I think even they have begun to appreciate that this isn't the long-term solution and that they will end up looking ridiculous, they will end up undermining their credibility uh, if they are perceived as the unpaid police force of Hollywood. Uh, if they are perceived as taking the side of uh, clueless uh, moguls uh, who don't understand what the future looks like. Um, and I'm hope, I hope that remains the case. Um, the dangerous thing is that increasingly the in entertainment industry is trying to connect copyright infringement with terrorism. Uh, there's an increasing effort you see that they're, they're saying that, oh, peer-to-peer -peer movie sharing is actually uh, helping people make unauthorized DVDs, which are in turn being used to finance terrorist operations in the Middle East. Uh, and I, I always worry, uh, that's obviously a very deliberate propaganda effort. Uh, I, I, I don't think anyone has any concrete evidence to show that you know, Al-Qaeda depends on free copies of Spider-Man to, to sustain its, its efforts. Um, but it is, I think, a very uh, cynical effort on the part of the movie industry to try to force uh, the state to try to force law enforcement officials to basically be their unpaid uh, policemen on this issue.